The letter to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 18 through 20 says this, This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith in a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may not learn to blaspheme. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, you are so good, you're so perfect. Lord, your word is good and perfect. Lord, may we learn from it today in these three verses. May they speak into our lives. And let, me, let, us, let us see that there's so much more to them than what meets the eye. By your Son's name we pray, the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. So, we continue in our study of 1 Timothy. And you'll notice there's going to be times in this book where we're going to cover 10 verses, 12 verses, and there's times where we're going to cover 3 verses. Well, today is kind of a loaded section, and uh, many would might think that uh, it is uh, just one of these three verses. He mentions these two guys here at the end, Hymenaeus and Alexander. He tells Timothy, wage good warfare. What's so special about these verses that we had to dedicate a whole week to them? Well, I believe there's one statement at the end that we must talk about that's going to take a lot. And that final statement is this statement. It says, Whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may, not learn, that they may learn to not blaspheme. That statement's going to hold a lot of weight. That statement has, is a loaded saying that's used one other place in Scripture, and I believe we have to talk about it because it's quite the thing. It's the topic of excommunication is what it is. And so that needs to be explained in great depth. And so we're going to pick apart this verse step by step, so we're also going to dive into the beginning verses as well. But last week, it was our second week in Timothy, we dove in uh, about the book and just kind of summarized again that this is a letter to a companion of Paul, someone that he viewed like a spiritual son, a child of the faith, as he's going to call him here. Um, and we ended up, this was our, basically we could summarize our last passage like this. It says, we must be and appoint people who know and reflect the grace of God while relying on the strength of Christ. In other words, we need to be people who are willing to rely on the strength of Christ. The goal we have set out in studying this book is that we would also be able to evaluate future elders or pastors that we would like to appoint here to help lead the church. And so I ask that you today is you don't just listen to it in terms of how does this apply to me, but how does this apply to our church as a whole? So I'm saying not me, like me as a pastor. You can do that, that's fine. But I'm saying not just you personally, but also as the church as a whole as we seek to move forward. And now God may bring up men that are supposed to fall into those roles, or he may not. We don't know. But the goal is in trying to go through this book where those God will bring those men about and make it clear to us who they are to be. So let's dive into this text. Starting in verse 18, this is what Paul says. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage good warfare, the good warfare. He mentions this charge to start. This is like a command or a, a task. It's not something that's just meant to be breezed over. And we might ask, what's this charge he's actually referring to? Does, is there a specific reference in the scripture? Because he's said a lot, if you read the previous passage, about abiding in the faith and being strong and, and, and talking about the gospel, sharing how Christ Jesus came to save sinners. Well, this is a callback, and Paul does this a lot. He's, he's very elaborate in his writings uh, Peter, in his own epistle, mentions that he, he, he knows that the, the people he was writing to were also reading Paul, and he's like, hey, good luck trying to understand this guy sometimes, because he's complicated. If you're a student of the Greek, and you're, which is the original languages, right? our Bibles come from uh, copies of Greek and Hebrew manuscripts, right? Uh, Paul did not write in English. Uh, Jesus did not speak English, which I'm sure he could have, right? That'd be kind of crazy if he just drop some English in on his audience right then they would have been like what are you saying Jesus right um, but he spoke a lot of he spoke Aramaic Hebrew and Greek 
And uh, so with those three, those are our texts are originally written in Greek and Hebrew and some Aramaic. So Old Testament's Hebrew and Aramaic. Um, you have some Aramaic quotes in the New Testament, usually quoting back. Um, but mostly New Testament's written in Greek. Well, when we study Greek, when we like, if you're in seminary, you'll go and you'll study, you know, Koine Greek. That's the ancient Greek. It's not like modern Greek, because I know a lot of people in this town speak Greek. It's nothing like it. It's, it won't make any sense to them. The Koine Greek, if you're a student in that, generally when you study, you're going to be studying someone like John, or someone like John who writes a little bit easier. Paul is usually like the last guy you get to because he can be a little hard to understand. There's times where Paul in the Greek makes up words. In other words, he uses words that are used in no other spots that we can tell in old ancient Greek, other outside biblical texts. He like will make up words. And then he also does, he's, his grammar sometimes, he'll use like extreme run-on sentences. But one of the things he does that can be a little hard for us to follow at times and this is something kind of interpreting all Pauline epistles, we have to look for certain cues to go back and figure out, okay, what are you talking about? Because he'll, he'll kind of go down little rabbit holes. Well, last week we kind of had a rabbit hole because the week before that he opens up talking about false teachers. And this is what he says in verse 3. He says, As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which promote speculations, rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. So that was the first like, command Paul gave Timothy. And then he goes on to like, elaborate on these things. He shares the gospel. And now we're back to, the, to this part. And he says, this charge I entrust to you. So the charge he's entrusting to Timothy, is the same command from verse 3. He's telling Timothy this charge, he might as well say this, this charge I entrust to you, to stay in Ephesus and tell certain persons not to teach false doctrine. That is basically what Paul is saying here when he says this word, this charge I entrust to you. So it's a call back. And he says this, Timothy, my child, now, was Timothy literally Paul's son? No, he was not. We read about Paul meeting Timothy, and perhaps Paul was even involved in Timothy's conversion. Was he his uh, physical son? No. He was like a spiritual father to Timothy. He had this great love for Timothy. He, he viewed him as a disciple of his. Some connections that we've made, and I've used this analogy a lot, is that we all should seek to be a Timothy and be a Paul. Now, what do I mean by being a Timothy? Well, being a Timothy means you're a student under somebody else. You have a mentor, right? We can go through our lives and think about different people that influenced us or helped us walk along in our faith or even helped us in life. For example, my father was a great mentor to me, uh, my, and he still is. Uh, Pastor Corey Green from North Point Church is a great mentor to me. And there's different people in my own life that I have influence on and I mentor. That's kind of like, I'm a Paul to them, and they would be a Timothy to me. We should be trying to, to have people that we trust and love enough in the faith. Now, some of us, we're, we're just learning, and so you just need to be a Timothy at the moment. But as you grow, you should seek to try to help disciple another person. Imagine how many people we could reach and disciple if we all found one person that we could help grow in their faith. Perhaps they didn't know Jesus at all, and we said, you know, I want to share the gospel with them. I want to lead them to Christ, and then I'm going to try to meet with them and have a small Bible study with them, just to teach them basic things, how to read their Bible, how to pray, different things like that. If we all come to do that, if every one of us, we would double this room. Think about that. If you had two, we'd like triple this room. It'd get even bigger than that. So in other words, we should all seek to be a child and try to have children of the faith. And he says this term, and this has is, this is stumped a lot of commentators. And I think some go too far one way and some go too far another in interpreting this next part of the sentence. It says, in accordance to the prophecies previously made about you. In other words, there is a charge and a call to Timothy. 
according to the prophecies previously made about him. He says that you may wage the good warfare. Now, we'll talk about these prophecies. What does that mean? Some have questioned, is, or is there like some, some secret thing we're not knowledgeable of? Is there, was there some great event that happened? I, said, yeah, I would say, yes, there indeed was a great event, talking about these prophecies that were made about Timothy. I believe it was a divine moment where God set Timothy aside and made it clear to the leaders of his local church and to Paul that he was meant to go do this ministry work, this missions work that he's doing currently, the reason that Paul's writing him this letter. I believe Paul is calling back to that. He's referring to Timothy's calling. We read of, we'll read about this later in 1 Timothy, but I'll quote it here just to help us understand. 1 Timothy 4.14 says this, Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. In other words, there was God clear through revelation to these men in that time that that Timothy was to be set apart for ministry. And exactly what that sounded like, what it looked like, was there a big booming voice in the sky? Was there a, you know, or was it simply, you know, they were recognizing uh, things in Timothy's life and characteristics? Was it through great prayer that, that God gave them the feeling, that God made it clear to them that they were supposed to, to, uh, to basically ordain Timothy and send him out for this ministry, to lay hands on him and pray for him? I'd say it could be a mixture of all these things because we know there was times where, where uh, Jesus, the Lord Jesus, appeared directly to Paul and spoke to him. We also know that there's times where Paul simply feels that the Holy Spirit is leading him a certain way and he says, God basically has said this. God has told me this. God has led me to this. Now, I believe the key we need to pull here, because this could get way deeper into the whole subject of what prophecy is and how does it apply to us today. I believe the thing we need to pull here the most is relying on what God has revealed to make the correct decisions that he would desire us to make. Okay, So relying on what God has revealed that we would make the correct decisions he desires us to make. Now, I don't believe that God is giving new revelation and by revelation, I mean what's written in this book. I consider to be revelation, special revelation, that is. We have a thing called general revelation, which is how God has revealed himself in creation, which is enough to show us there is a God and that God does indeed exist, but it's not enough to save us. We need God's special revelation through his word or the sharing of the gospel, which is from his word that can lead us to saving knowledge of him. Now, I believe the main application we take from this is that Paul and the other elders there, they listened to God's leading in ordaining Timothy and calling him to ministry. They didn't rely on their own wisdom. They didn't rely on their own smarts. They relied on what God had led them to do through prayer and his revealing to them. There's some more sayings about that you can go look up about this prophecy, but in the end, some, it's kind of up in the air with commentators about what it means. So I would just commend to you that, that we just simply need to rely on God's leading through the Holy Spirit and through prayer to make decisions about calling people specifically. But this is what's so cool about this is Paul makes this call back to Timothy's calling to ministry and says, hey, Timothy, you can do this. You, you, can, you can handle these false teachers in your church because God set you aside for this ministry. That's why he's bringing this up. He's not bringing this up just, to, just for funsies. He's bringing this up to remind Timothy, Timothy, remember this moment where we set you aside and, and we said, we're going to send you. God has called you. He's empowered you. And he's going he's gonna to help lead you through it. Remember that, Timothy. Because I can tell you, Timothy was probably having a really hard time with some of these guys. Because they were probably pretty charismatic. They were probably pretty, you know, good, had strong leadership skills even. They probably had influence with people. They probably had a way where they could say something and people would listen to them. So Timothy has to come in behind them and try to convince everybody of the opposite, of the truth. And so 
He says an encouragement to Timothy. And fellow believer, this is what I would encourage us to see this as well. Is that when you go through hard times and struggles, remember that God called you to salvation. You might be struggling or battling with sin, but remember, God saved you and set you apart for a reason. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can overcome these things. So be encouraged. Remember your calling. Remember when God put His mark on you. Remember that moment. And that will help bring you through. And he says this to Timothy. He says that by them, by remembering this calling he has, that you may wage the good warfare, which it ties into the next verse as well. It says, holding faith in a good conscience. What is this warfare that we're talking about? This is the battle we fight is not one of flesh and blood. That's, we don't fight it with physical swords. Rather, we fight it through the power of the Spirit, with the shield of faith and the Word of God. This warfare is a spiritual warfare. I do indeed believe that Satan is real and he's at work. He tries to create issues and division and spread heresy. But God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, equips us to fight it. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 4 says this, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. But the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Now, this battle we fight is not physical. Now, there has been times where Christians have been attacked indeed physically for their faith, right? We have dozens and thousands of stories of that. But the main fight we fight is ultimately a spiritual fight. Believers engage in spiritual warfare daily as we seek to combat sin in our lives and false teaching that is rampant. So first we have to kill the sin in our lives and we then have to help keep ourselves pure from false doctrine, false teaching. If you and I are like soldiers in an army, we are in squads or platoons with the leader of the army being, with the squads or leaders of the platoons in the army being Christ ultimately as the leader and our pastors as our platoon or squad leader. So in other words, we have like a small army and let's say like our church is one squad or one platoon and then the next church down the street is one squad or one platoon. Whose marching orders ultimately do we all go under? We all go under that of Christ. That if they're a true church teaching true doctrine, we all march under the things. We might have some differences, right? But ultimately, we all march under the same marching orders of Christ. And we fight a spiritual battle, one that is not of flesh and blood. Paul commends the people in, the, in Ephesus. Ephesians 6, 10 through 17, he tells us how we are equipped to fight this good warfare. It says, finally, being strong in the Lord and in strength of his might, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having... And having done all to stand firm, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. What I'm trying to get you to see is God has given us the equipment to fight this war. God has not sent us in the battle unequipped. God has given us all these things. Now, some of us might be better or worse at using different ones, but we all have the armor. That's the beauty of it. We might need to work on different things and get better at different ones, but hey, let's work on that as we fight this battle. Now, what will ultimately happen in this fight? That's the question, right? What's going to happen in this spiritual war? Well, some wars, as we fight here on earth, we don't always know the outcome. We don't know who's going to win. We have a thought about who's going to win, but we don't know. One of my favorite things is college football, where they'll predict who's going to win every single week, and, and I like to see who's going to cause an upset that week. In other words, we don't actually always have a guaranteed outcome. One team might be far more talented than another, and they probably should win. 
But there's times where things get flipped upside down, so we don't always have a guaranteed outcome. But with this, we do have a guaranteed outcome. Now, the guaranteed outcome is simply this. Christ will return, and we win. Pretty cool, right? We had a talk. We did our ABF. And if you're looking to go deeper in studying these things, we, we have Adult Bible Fellowship at 930. We have a cool classroom set apart for that. And uh, today we are talking about the last chapter in our Confession of Faith, the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith. And the last chapter is all about the end times. Like, what does it mean when Christ returns? Some things like that. It's pretty broad, pretty general. But in the end, ultimately, this is what it was. Christ returns. He saves his people. He defeats sin and death. And it's a wrap. That's the cool, encouraging part. But here's another really encouraging part. That while we're here, we have a directive and we have a promise. In Matthew 16, verses 13 through 18, Jesus was talking to his disciples and he said this, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, this is important. Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church. So the church is going to be built, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, last time I checked, gates don't attack. Gates defend. In other words, we as the church in this spiritual battle, we are on the offensive. We are on the attack. We're not sitting here hunkered in a bunker. We are on the attack, and it's a spiritual battle that we fight. And it says that the gates of hell shall not overcome it. They shall not overcome it now, and they certainly will not overcome it when Christ returns. That's the beauty we have. We're running out of time. I need to hurry up. Then he gives this extra note in 19 where he says, holding faith in a good conscience. He says, by rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith. Now, what does it mean when he says holding faith in a good conscience? Well, one, it's holding to true doctrine, and it's holding to something, true doctrine, that doesn't hurt our conscience. And it's holding and defeating sin, so therefore our conscience is not burdened with the sin resting on our heart. I believe that is what he's referring to. And they asked me, how do I accomplish this, Pastor? How do I go through my day-to-day life and and help fight sin? Well, I believe there's some spiritual disciplines that can help. But ultimately, ultimately, these things are only going to be accomplished one way. And that is through the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the daily reminder that you have died to yourself. Christ has now risen you and made you anew through faith, and you are now a new creation in Him. That is the ultimate way in which we will keep to a true faith, is the constant reminder of that. As soon as we start to forget that, we start straying off into all kinds of things that can make a shipwreck of our faith. But there are things that can help keep us reminded of the gospel. And these things include of this. One, reading Scripture. Reading Scripture. When we talk to people and they're going through a really hard time, and a lot of times it's easy to turn to other things to try to bring us comfort. Whether that be food, sinful things. Sometimes we try to drown our our sorrows in food or alcohol or pornography or, or different things like that. We try to run from feelings. We try to just ignore it and stuff it down. But meanwhile, something that I know that can help fill that hole in us is simply reading Scripture. Simply reading Scripture. Something that can help give us encouragement. These words are encouraging. They they give us comfort. They remind us of God's promises. They ultimately give us that reminder at the end that Christ returns and we win. If you need encouragement, go go read the end of Revelation. If you be reminded of the gospel, go read Romans. If you're reminded of the great work of Jesus, go read John. If you need a reminder of God triumphing over his enemies, go read Exodus. 
there's a spot in Scripture for everything we need. Charles Spurgeon says this. It's one of my favorite quotes from him. He was admonishing his congregation, and he said this. He's talking about Scripture. He said, there is dust enough on some of your Bibles to write damnation with your fingers. That's a scathing quote. Words. We don't want to be just leaving this book on the shelf. It's a living. It's an active book. It like talks to us, right? It's like, read me. Pick me up. That's what we should be doing when we're discouraged. We we shouldn't be turning to these other things. We should be first turning to Scripture, which then will lead us to do this. It'll turn us to pray. It'll turn us to pray. There's many prayers in Scripture. If you need help praying, what I encourage you to do is start your prayer and open up the book of Psalms and just start reading the Psalms. God likes to hear His own words. God likes to hear us praise Him, but He also likes to hear us praise Him through what He has already revealed. This is, can be easy and encouraging to our own hearts as we read them because we're also absorbing it. Pray. Next, Gathering with the Lord's people on the Lord's day for corporate worship. Why do I bring this up? It's become so easy, especially in our modern day today. A lot of times church gets put on the back burner. And and we say, hey, you know, if I can't go this week, that's just fine, right? It's okay. The reason I'm encouraging you is not just so I want to help boost attendance or anything like that. My my purpose of saying this and saying that you need to be at church is because I care about your soul. Okay? And so we should be trying to set aside time for church. Not even just time, perhaps setting even apart the whole day for God. I say we meet on the Lord's day with the Lord's people. Set it in your heart that this is the day that I'm going to dedicate to church. Now, we don't stay here all day, right? They used to. Something that used to happen quite a bit. Something that happens we struggle to even do is show up on time. And a lot of times, as soon as it's done, we're, we're hitting the doors. Because what has happened, we've made plans We've made church fit around our plans, not our plans fit around church. And and I have been guilty of this in the past myself. There's been times in my own life where where I genuinely put church, or this time I get to spend in corporate worship with my brothers and sisters in Christ to encourage them and they encourage me and to hear the teaching of the word. It's been times where I've put other things ahead. There's been times where I'm present, like I'm physically here, but I'm not mentally here. There's times, it's easy, trust me. Hey, listen, by the way, you know, I'm just going to say this. I'm a huge football fan, okay? I love the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And I'm not a bandwagon fan who just became a fan when Brady got there. I've been a fan when we were terrible. I remember my earliest memories are going to, we went to a game, we played the Houston Texans. First play of the game was an 80-yard touchdown bomb to Andre Johnson, who played for the Texans, and we got blown out 48 to 12. Okay, I've been a Bucks fan. I love football. But here's the thing. I can't put football or my lunch plans above Christ. I think that's when we wander into sin. Because you know what has happened? Is our time has become an idol to us. In other words, my plans are more important than what my time with God's people in God's house. And so my encouragement about being present and being mentally here, when you're here, don't be thinking about what comes after this. Don't be thinking about your lunch plans. Don't be thinking about, you know, the football game. Right? Be thinking about what's going on here. Pay attention. Think about it. Be engaged in worship. Sing the songs. I can tell you, if, you want to, if, you're, if you're downcast and you need encouragement, sing to somebody in the corporate worship. There's a time where we all need to be able to sit in the congregation and sing, it is well with my soul with tears in our eyes. 
There's times where we need to be able to sit in the congregation and sing about amazing grace when we're fighting God's sin and we feel like a wretch. Fighting our sin, not God's sin. That's heresy, right? Another thing I encourage you to do, get here early and stay after. Because when you do that, this is what happens. This is what happens. We do this thing called talk to one another. And what you might find is that when you talk to one another, I hope that you like each other. And I hope that you find some encouragement in that. If you find yourself talking to people and it's constantly causing you troubles, we should probably have a conversation. Because I can tell you, I have a lot of people here. I know, I know everybody here. I love you all. I like being your pastor. You guys are really encouraging. It's great to hear you guys be kind. It's great to hear these things. It's an encouragement to me. There's times where I'm having a rough week, and then I go talk to Linda, and she'll just say something super sweet, and it's like, well, hey, my, my, my whole day and my whole week was just made by that. There's an, there's an encouragement to that. But if you just get here, like, as we're starting to sing, or, you know, and then you leave right as we're ending, you didn't really get to talk to anybody. Yeah, you got to shake someone's hand while the worship team was coming up. But did you really get to know them? Did they get to encourage you? Did you get to encourage them? See, when we come to church, it's, we don't just receive, right? It's so easy today in our world. But we, we like to, we're so consumeristic. We go to Walmart, we shop on Amazon, which I love Amazon, right? I love being able to just go on and order things, and it's all just oriented around me. We come to church not only to receive, but also to give. Whether it be, you know, which monetarily we can through our acts of service, through our encouragement to one another. That is how we keep of a strong and good faith. It's hard to stay strong when there's no accountability. Being close with another gives accountability. They can keep us right on these things. They will help us abide in Christ. So I encourage you, get here early. And when you're here, be present, not just physically, but mentally and spiritually. Sing the songs. Pay attention during the preaching. I'll try not to be boring so you fall asleep, okay? And then stay late. Talk to somebody. Invite somebody out to lunch. I know we all have lunch plans. Most of the time, right? Have them over to your house. I like to eat out, so invite me out to eat sometime, okay? I mean, it's pretty obvious, but... Chili's, you know... Beef O'Brady's, right? I have a list of places. Tons of great Greek food here, right? Also, seek to grow your knowledge. That's another way we can abide in the faith and remain strong. If we're not swimming up, we're sinking. So seek to grow your knowledge of God. That's why we're trying to be present mentally in the preaching. That's why we try to come, we, we lose a little bit of sleep, and we show up at 9.30, and we come to Adult Bible Fellowship where we have other guys that God has brought in and can help teach and lead. So you don't have to hear me drown on for two hours. God has brought us people that can that lead that well and teach us. I encourage you, come to that. Seek to keep growing in deep relationships. But ultimately, we have to do this. We have to abide in Christ. And all those other things help us do that. That is the beauty of it. So I encourage you. Be active in the congregation. Be active in your walk with God. And through those things, we can wage good warfare and we can hold to the faith of in a good conscience. And it says, by rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith. By rejecting those previous things, some have made a shipwreck. They've, they've, they've hurt their faith. I'm sure we all know people who used to be very active in their faith, very active in the church, even pastors that I know. I know many, and a lot of it's pastors' kids. A lot of it's people who went to church for many years. I had family who, who did this. I had a grandfather, and he told me, well, I used to be very religious when I was younger. It's like, well, you don't go to church now, Grandpa. And he had his reasons or whatever, but ultimately, there was times where he had a shipwreck of his faith because he wasn't surrounded by people that could help encourage him. Now, what Paul's also referring to here is the shipwreck of the faith happening because of false teaching. It's happening because of false teaching. And 
So it's like rejecting the gospel. It's rejecting truth. And now we can usually tie some things together. When people fall into false teaching, generally there's some sort of sin in their life that has led them there. The most active and modern one today is, I believe, homosexuality and the denial, people saying that homosexuality is not a sin, saying that sexual immorality of any form is not a sin. I believe that is, if you can talk to those people and the people I've interacted with and have seen in debates and things like that, usually it was is they had homosexual desires. They desired these things, and so it led them to try to go, well, if I like this so much, then why would God be against it? So they end up twisting scripture and, and crushing it and, and embracing their own thing and saying, well, we're just going to have to reject those parts of the Bible. That's usually how someone ends up involved in sin. Now, Paul's going to bring up two people. In verse 20, he says this, Among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Now, who is Hymenaeus and Alexander? Well, first I'll do Alexander. Alexander, we don't really know who he was. Here's why. It's a very common name at that time. Paul references another Alexander at a time who was like a metal worker. He says, Alexander has brought me great pain. Now, that's the only other things we have about an Alexander. So this Alexander could have been that guy, and I'm, and I'm not saying he's not, but it could, it could be, but it's also likely it could have been another Alexander doing a specific false teaching. Then we have this other guy, Hymenaeus. Now, Hymenaeus we know some about because Paul talks about him again. We know, we know about Hymenaeus is this, is he denied, he, he believed that the resurrection already happened. So in other words, not Jesus' resurrection, the final resurrection. We learned this today in ABF. There's going to be one resurrection at the end where the living and the dead are going to be brought to Christ, right? And that's when Christ returns and there's a final judgment, things like that. There's one resurrection. This guy was teaching that this resurrection already happened. And Paul ends up addressing different scenarios like this, that saying that, hey, like, you know, because the people were worried they'd missed some things. So Paul's leading some correction. 2 Timothy 2, 16 through 18 says this, and this is great. But avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some. So it's these false teachers. Paul's calling them out by name. This one's the second time to Timothy. And he's saying that this, this teaching they have done have hurt the faith of some people. This is why we care about false teaching, because we want to protect the flock. This is why we need pastors who are willing to stand firm on the truth, even when it makes somebody uncomfortable. Because it's easy just to let anybody say what they want to say and teach what they want to teach, right? It's easy just to kind of relax, because then you don't have to confront them. You don't have to do anything like that. It's hard to go and confront them. This is why Paul's encouraging Timothy here. That's why Paul was referring to Timothy's calling. And he says this, Paul says he's handed them over to Satan. Now, when we say this, you know, a lot of us, we think about like modern satanic rituals or things like that or Hollywood movies we've seen. Was Paul like, you know, having a little pentagram and lighting his candles and sacrificing these guys? No, absolutely not. What he means by handing them over to Satan is means that he's kicked them out of the church. If the church is... The, the specific house of God, and this is a simple analogy, this is not, there's, there's holes in this. If church is the house of God and the people where the people of God commune, almost like another nation, then removing those people from it is like excommunicating them. It's like handing them over back to the, the world of Satan. Now, does God reign over the whole world? Absolutely. But there's times in Scripture where it calls the world, the sinful things, the dominion of Satan. And so Paul handing them back over, he's kicking them out of the church. That's what he means by handing them over to Satan. This term is only used one other time, and there's even a, a greater thing attached to it. This is in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And now this is all part of a doctrine that in systematic theology we would call this is church discipline. Church discipline. Now, just as like a parent disciplines a child, the purpose of it is correction. 
that we would be guided from wrong things into right things. Now, there's sections in Matthew chapter 18, and we don't have as much time to go through that, that talk about individual, how we deal with things. And it talks about first, if your brother sins against you, you go to him one-on-one. And then if you go to him and you confront him about it and they say, no, I reject that, you know, you're totally wrong, I'm not apologizing, then it says you bring two or three more with you and you all confront that person so that you have witnesses with you. And if they still go, no, I'm, I'm against you, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to apologize, I'm not going to repent, then it says to take it a step further. Now the hope is that they would repent, that's the goal. The goal is they'd be restored. If they still will not repent after that, it says that you take it before the entire church. Where their sin is brought public and it's exposed to all who are witness. And then the church makes a judgment on whether to remove the person or not from their assembly. And this is what called is called excommunication. Now there is a time where this excommunication doesn't go through these three or four steps where it just simply jumps right to this person has to be removed from the congregation. Many of us, this may sound unloving, but it's important because it's to protect the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul deals with a public gross sin. And I'll explain it here. Let's just read the scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among the pagans. In other words, there's something, there's sexual immorality going on in the church that even those who worship all these other gods and do all these horrible and perverse things in idol worship and Baal worship and different things like that, that they wouldn't even allow. And you guys are allowing it, is what he says. He says, for a man has his father's wife. And by has, I don't mean he just gave her flowers. This is a gross, inappropriate sexual relationship that this man is having with his father's wife, like a stepmother. In verse 2, it says, And you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. There is, Paul says, It's so well known. Everybody knows about this. See, they were celebrating. They were like, man, we're so grace-giving that even though this guy is in this inappropriate relationship with his stepmom, we're just going to let it go on because we just show so much forgiveness and so much grace. We don't judge anybody here. So we're just going to let it happen. Paul's saying, no, what's wrong with you? Verse 3, he says, For though absent in the body, I am present in the spirit. And as if present... I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. And this is what's important. Paul's not just like, "Let's, let's just kick this guy out, and that's it. Paul gave a reasoning for it. I've been part of ministries where we had to do this to somebody. And I can tell you positively, it was the hardest thing I have ever had to do in ministry. Because you have somebody that claims to be a believer, but are walking in open, unrepentant sin, contrary to the ways of God, and they're being very flagrant about it, they're being very open about it, and everybody knows about it. The rest of the group... It was a ministry. Look to myself and my wife, and we're like, how are you guys going to respond to this? And we had to follow Scripture. We had to remove that person. And was that difficult because we were worried about this person's spiritual well-being after that? Absolutely. But here's the purpose of it. It says that the destruction of the flesh may occur so that the person's spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. In other words, this removal can have some sort of benefit. And this is the benefit. The benefit is this, is that by disfellowshipping this person or excommunicating them from the church, they will miss the fellowship and the worship and the encouragement from the church, and they will turn from their sin and come back and say, I've messed up. 
please help. Which, if you go to 2 Corinthians, Paul talks about restoring that guy because he ends up, this is exactly what happens. He gets kicked out. He goes, man, I really miss the church. And he comes back and he quits. He repents and he's restored. And again, these people were boasting. And Paul says again, verse 6, says, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? This is why we care about this because just a little bit of sin can spread to everybody. Because if this is allowed, certainly this will also be allowed. If this certain thing is happening here, then I can get away with this. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know the little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival not with old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Whereas Paul's saying, keep the church pure. Get the leaven out of here that we may be an unleavened lump, something pure and holy. Verse 9, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not all the meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy or the and swindlers or idolaters. Since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother. This is the important part. Who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. So in other words, this is specifically for people who claim to be your brother in Christ or your sister in Christ. This is not just for us to go out, find somebody who's not a Christian and cast judgments on them. That's not what this is saying. If people came in here who were just looking into the faith, we're we're trying to study it, and they were of this list, then we try to love on them and share Christ with them. And we work on them. We don't practice this type of thing. We welcome everybody. But when someone starts claiming to be a believer and they identify with one of these things and they make it their lifestyle, then we have to practice this judgment on them. This might be the first time some of you have actually heard this. Well, I heard it the first time. I was like, Whoa, this is a lot to take in. Because I've always heard, judge not lest you be judged. Right? Well, there is a thing called righteous judgment that God requires us to practice. Now, how does this apply to us in the church? Well, there might come a day where either a false teacher comes or some public gross sin occurs with someone here and we have to disfellowship them. And I can promise you that's not something that you do hastily. It's not something that you get a whiff of something and you and act on this. This is something that's investigated. It's something that's, there's multiple conversations that might happen with the person. It's not done like that. But the key here is this. It's a hard thing to do. As I said before, my one experience with this, it was so hard. But in order to be a proper true church with a proper true faithful shepherd or shepherds, we have to practice this. We have to practice this because God's word calls us to. We've talked about so much today, so much today. So I summed it up to two points. These two points are this. First, we must be and appoint people who are willing to wage good warfare for Christ. In other words, we must be people, we must be people, so we must be believers who wage good warfare, good spiritual warfare, and we must appoint people who are going to lead us to do the same. And how can somebody lead you to do the same unless they are doing it themselves? We must be people who do that, and we must find people who do that, that can lead us to do that. Second, we must be and appoint people who are willing to protect the flock of God. So first, we must be church members who take this seriously, because as we saw it, as I quoted Matthew 18 to you, that final summation, it's up to the whole church to remove that person from among you. And then Paul even commends the whole church, remove that person from among you. 
We must be strong and faithful church members who are willing to purge things from us that damage the body. And then also we need people who are going to willingly lead us to do such things to protect the flock of God. And I must clarify, those two things, those handing over to Satan's, it was for heresy and public gross sexual immorality. Those were the two examples we have in Scripture. But let us be people and let us appoint people who lead us in such a way. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you for this day. I thank you for your word, God. And though sometimes it's easy just to breeze over things in Scripture, God, and it's easy to to look and study these things and just move on. God, I appreciate today that you led me and you led us to slow down, to really dig into this. And God, I just pray that if something like this ever arises, that, that we would have the boldness to practice it and that you would give us the wisdom to carry it out correctly. Lord, we care about your word so much and we just want to be a true and faithful church. And Lord, help us wage good warfare. Help us not have shipwreck of our faith, but Lord, help us remain true and faithful to what you've called. Bend our hearts to come and get here early. Be present and active during worship and then to stay late, God. Let us care about one another and maybe take advantage of those times of the early and staying late to to care for one another and see how we can pray for one another. Let us try to keep a deeper relationship with one another. Let's invite somebody to lunch, Lord. God, help us carry one another's burdens. Give us strength and give us peace, O God, that we may walk strongly with you. By your Son's name we pray, the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. I'd like to invite the worship team for one final...